This module focuses on the Vedic age, costume and culture. Sometime between 1700 and 1500 BCE, invasions from the northwest by the Aryans, a pastoral Indo-Eastern people, may have contributed to the decline of the Indus Valley civilization. As the Aryans settled in the region, they introduced cultural changes, including the Sanskrit language, a strict social hierarchy, and beliefs in reincarnation. These ideas of faith were set down in Vedas, collection of hymns and rituals of behavior that became the basis of Hinduism at the end of the first millennium BCE. Other new beliefs also emerged during the Vedic period, most notably Buddhism and Jainism. At this time, two forms of governing bodies came into being, Republic and the Monarchy. The former was the older tradition and had continued from an early Vedic form of political organization, in which these republics were governed by an assembly of tribal representatives, which met frequently. As larger areas were knit together into kingdoms, it became impossible for the tribal representatives to meet frequently, and a system of monarchy replaced them. In these kingdoms, full powers were vested in a sole authority, the king, around whom a complicated ritual was established to proclaim his divine nature. By the late Vedic period, the use of textiles and apparel was associated with certain ceremonies and frequently mentioned in sacred texts. Silk was also mentioned in the Vedas and commonly used in Vedic rituals. The only source for costume and clothing in this period comes from the literary works and cannot be verified visually. Both men and women wore a range of unstitched garments comprising of the antarya or the lower garment, uttarya or upper garment and a multi-purpose stole or sash called kayabandh. In addition to this, women also wore a patka, which was decorative strip made from cloth, woven fabrics, uh, fibers, leather, woolen fringes or plaited strips of yarn and tucked into antarya at the front. The ushnisa or turban was used by men. Women also wore the pratidhi, which was a breastband tied at the back. In addition to the unstitched garments, there is a mention of a cut and sewn garment called atka, which was a hip or calf length garment like a kurta or tunic, worn by both men and women. These basic components were draped in various styles. Antarya styles include the kacha style, a trouser like drape. In the Hatti Sondaka style, the antarya was tied around the waist and the shorter edge taken between the legs and tucked in at the back waist, while the longer end was pleated and tucked in at the front. In the Machavalaka style or the fishtail style, it was draped like a kacha style and then the longer border ends were picked up and pleated in the shape of a fishtail and tucked in at the waist. Chatur Karnaka was a style where the antarya was pleated into two fishtails and tucked in front. A few other styles are mentioned in the literature, but they are difficult to visualize like the Tala Vantaka or fan shaped style, the palm leaf style and the Sata Valika style. Shoes were initially worn during rituals and by the military. Later they were worn by the wealthy as well. The text of Mahavagya talks about a wide range of Vedic footwear that was in use. Dyed leather soles and boots of many colors like red, yellow and black and magenta with thick soles or padded with cotton wool and even gold and silver. Shoes were known to be decorated with jewels. Horns and peacock feathers also adorned them. The poor wore footwear made of straw or palm leaves and bamboo. The Aryans were fond of bathing and washing and both rich and poor made it a part of their daily rituals. Combs and razors were in use. Women dyed their fingertips with the crimson juice of lac. Jewelry made of suvarna or gold, rajata or silver, loha or bronze, hasti or ivory and sankla or mother of pearl. It is in this period that crowns made of horn were worn. 
as were stupa, a cone-like head ornament for men, and round crowns called the kumba, or tiaras. Women wore fillets called opasa and shraj in their hair, along with garlands of flower or gold garlands called hiranyasa shraj. Earrings were known as pravatra, and the niska or coin necklace was very popular. Bahu or gold armlets, bracelets or parihasta and ivory brangles or hasti were also worn. Rings and hip girdles were also worn. Buddhist monks or bhikkhus and nuns or bhikkhunis wore the same garments as laymen, only their names differed. The sangati or loincloth, the antarvasak or skark and the utrasanga or chadar were all linen and dyed yellow. Silken chadars were allowed, but no skin or patterned fabrics. The bhikkhunis could wear a bodice or kanchuka. Their bedding consisted of a sheet and they could carry one spare loincloth. Bhikkhus wore a kayabanth of two varieties, one ordinary and the other intricately woven with edges that were turned back and sewn. Sometimes it was held in place by a clasp made of bone or conch shell. In the Vedic age, the word Sindhu, found in the library of Asurbanipal, the Assyrian king, was used to signify Indian cotton. The early Greeks mentioned that Indians were dressed in wool grown on trees. Fine cotton linen, wool and silk were available and the last was known to be produced in Bihar and Banaras. Pressed felt namdas called namtaka and fluffy blankets called kovja were expensive and used only by nobility. The skins of many animals including the lion, tiger, leopard, cow and deer was used as bed coverings, footwear and even clothes. Cloth woven from hemp was called sana and that made from fibre of bhag tree was known as bhaga and is still woven in the Kumao region under the name of Bhagela. Woolen chadar called Dusa is still available in the Punjab. Another variety of woolen cloth was available called Vahitha. Dyes that were used included indigo, yellow, crimson, magenta, black and turmeric or haldi and dyed fabrics were often patterned. Bleaching had been perfected and clothes had decorative borders of cut work known as kati kinari or embroidery. Many types of buttons were available for fastening garments made from bones, conch shells, yarn, gold and silver. This module focuses on ancient Greece, costume and culture. Let us begin by reviewing the chronology of ancient Greece. The first great civilization of the West emerged on the island of Crete during the second millennium BCE. The civilization was called Minoan by modern historians because of the ruling king Minos. Very little is known about this civilization despite an abundance of surviving buildings and artifacts. The Aegean, like the Sumerians, shared a common culture but functioned under a decentralized system of city-states. At the core was the palace that housed ruling families and provided space for religious sanctuaries and administrative agencies. Agriculture and seafaring ventures were the main source of the Aegean economy. Around 1700 BCE, all the great palaces seemed to have been simultaneously destroyed by an earthquake. The palace of Knossos was a newer building with open-air structures and was lavishly decorated. Notable features are the dis distinctive shape of the columns that tapered downward like inverted tree trunks. The building technology included unparalleled engineering advances like underground plumbing systems with flushing conduits for toilets. At the peak of their civilization, the Minoans controlled much of the trade of the eastern Mediterranean Sea. Their famous eggshell pottery has been found as far east as Syria and as far south as Egypt. The costumes of the Minoans were especially unique and stayed impervious to influences of other civilizations. Around 1480 BCE, 
the Minoan Islands were devastated by natural disasters. Volcanic eruption, earthquakes, tsunami tidal waves and choking clouds of ash and did not recover. It later fell under the invasions of the Mycenaeans. The main sources of information comes from numerous statuettes, incised seals, metalwork and ceramics and some of the most extraordinary frescoes of the ancient world have been excavated at Knossos and Thera. Unlike the Egyptian and Assyrian method of painting on dry plaster, the Minoan renderings were true frescoes done by applying pigment on wet plaster. By this process, the colors were more permanent and retained their vibrancy through the ravages of time. The Minoans represented themselves in their artwork with tall and slender youthfulness. Men were always clean-shaven, the ideal masculine aesthetic emphasized broad shoulders, narrow hips, slim waist and muscular thighs. The ideal Minoan woman was proportioned with long, lithe limbs, slender waist and full round breasts. Men were shown as tanned and women were represented with alabaster white skin. Both men and women wore their hair in long curling locks, sometimes extending to the waist. Minoans worshipped many gods and goddesses in a wide variety of forms. The most important of them was the Magna Mater or Mother Earth, goddess who was a guardian of the city. The most famous image of the goddess is the handler of snakes, also known as the snake goddess. Minoans had a two-class society comprising of commoners and high class. The divide between the two was very wide. Women enjoyed an equal status as men and often participated in festivals and public games alongside men. Ancient Minoan men wore only loincloths, which were small pieces of fabric wrapped around the waist and covered the genitals. Loincloths were made from a wide variety of materials such as linen, leather or wool and decorated with bright colors and patterns. Men also wore skirts which ended at the thigh. They were wrapped around the body and ended in a point with a suspended weighted tassel at the center front or center back. While early Minoan men usually went bare-chested, in the later years of the Minoan civilization, men often wore simple tunics and long robes. Minoan women wore skirts that were bell-shaped with few variations. One version was fitted at the waist and flared gently to the ground. Another style was made of a series of horizontal or V-shaped ruffles or flounces, with each successive ruffle wider in circumference than the one above it. Women also wore close-fitting blouses that were cut low in the front to expose the breasts. Most of these bodices had close-fitting sleeves and sometimes even had small puffs at the shoulder. They also wore aprons on top of their skirts. It may have had ritualistic references and may have its origin from the loincloth which were worn by both sexes earlier. Both men and women also wore animal skins and heavy wool shawls to keep themselves warm. Men and women also wore T-shaped tunics. The men wore theirs shorter than the women. These tunics were generally decorated with patterned bands at the hem along the slides following the shoulder lines. Women left their hair long, used a fillet and elaborate jeweled bands to keep it in place. Hats range from high, tiered, brimless styles to beret-like flat hats. Men kept their hair long or cut close to the head. They sometimes tied their hair into a braid or lock at the back of the head. They also used a fillet to hold the hair in place. Hat styles included ritualistic gear, elaborately decorated on high, round and crown-like with a tall plume. Turbans, small caps and wide brim hats were also worn. Men and women wore sandals or shoes with pointed toes that fitted the foot closely and ended at the ankle. Athletes wore a soft shoe with what appears to be a short sock or ankle support. 
Evidence suggests that Minoans went barefoot indoors. Both sexes wore rings, bracelets and armlets. Women also wore necklaces and earrings. Women also wore eye makeup and used some sort of lip colouring. Men went clean shaven. North of the Crete Islands was a land in turmoil and transition during the early part of the second millennium. From the north and the east, migrating, warring people poured into the peninsula of what is today modern Greece. These invading tribes established a number of kingdoms in this region by the 16th century BCE. Early Mycenaeans battled each other during the early phases of their cultural development. They were aggressive and suspicious of each other. Consequently, they built hilltop fortresses, uh, palaces that were constructed of heavy, impenetrable masonry. Eventually, for the greater good, these various kingdoms managed to forge alliances to benefit everyone. After the collapse of the Minoan civilization, the Mycenaeans developed dominant naval forces as well as mercantile fleets. They then invaded and colonized the Crete Islands. Evidence of Mycenaean costume comes from grave sites and tombs. Most objects found are of military nature, swords, daggers and armature. A boar's tusk helmet was a distinctive and common component of Mycenaean military costumes. Sometimes a soldier's wrap skirt was worn with a tea-cut tunic. Soldiers also wore shin guards called greaves with short boots. Very little evidence has survived about the costume for women. It appears that some women wore tiered flounce skirts like the Minoan women. These dresses were cut in a tunic dress style rather than bodice and skirt. Waists were not cinched in with a corset belt. Some had long sleeves and aprons are absent. The later Greeks or Hellenes were the product of an intermingling of the remnants of the Mycenaeans with invading tribes of Dorians from the north and Ionians from Asia Minor from the 11th century BCE to the 8th century BCE. Village communities began to evolve into city-states that would provide the first type of democratic government with elections, juries and government by citizens of city-states. By the 7th century BCE, Greek philosophers had begun to interpret the world rationally in terms of reason rather than religion. Intellectual argument, the forerunner of modern science, was broadly popular with all classes of Greek society. Physical exercise played a significant role in education and daily life. Every town had an open-air gymnasium and larger cities had several. From their humanistic understanding of the harmony between man, nature and reason, the Greeks developed their extraordinary achievements in art, architecture, literature, philosophy, mathematics, history and the sciences. Greek philosophers such as Socrates, Plato and Aristotle pondered the nature of the universe, the meaning of life and ethical values. Tragic dramatists such as Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides wrote dramas dealing with the nature and fate of man. Greeks developed history in a new literary form which related and analyzed past experiences. Greek sculpture glorified the human body using techniques to build in marble. They also created architectural masterpieces. Despite the high level of education and intellectual pursuits of Greek men, the women were restricted and played a subordinate role in society. They were considered inferior to men both physically and intellectually. They could not own property and had no more civil rights than slaves. Respectable women were rarely seen in public and then only when accompanied by other women. The role of women was to bear and raise children, maintain the household and supervise servants and slaves. Women also undertook spinning and weaving for their household needs. They also added embroidery ornamentation to their fabrics. The key element in Greek style of costume is draping. The garments consisted of various sizes of rectangular pieces of cloth tied or pinned about the body rather than cut and sewn to shape. 
The basic costume, especially for peasants or slaves, was the exomis. It was a wrap garment worn fastened over the left shoulder. The wrap garment, when worn as a cloak, was called clain, made of wool without any adornment or coloration. The chitin was worn by both men and women. It was a cylinder of fabric sewn on one side and tied with fibulae over both shoulders. The lengths of chitin varied for men starting from mid-thigh to floor length for ceremonial dress. Women wore floor length chitons. They were tied in different styles to add variety to silhouette. A look exclusive to women was the blousing of the fabric over a series of belts. This table here gives details of the different types of chitons worn in the Greek period. Ionic chitin was similar to Doric chitin except the amount of fabric used and the number of small pins that were required to hold up sleeves. Both men and women wore the Ionic chitin with varying sleeve lengths. By the 5th century BCE, lightweight linen became increasingly used for chitons. This material provided new stylistic opportunities such as pleating and other textural surface treatments such as crinkle. The result was springy, fluid lines of fabric that flattered and enhanced the motion of the body. The look of this diaphanous material with its contouring vertical creases may have contributed to changes in artistic style of the classical period. The peplos was worn by women. It was like a chitin, only much longer, allowing a section to be turned down at the top, creating a bib-like flap in the front and a hood-like flap at the back. Men wore a short cloak called clamis. It was fastened to the right or sometimes the centre front. It was often decorated with colourful borders all over floral patterns, geometric designs or stars. Women wore the clamidon, which was a rectangular fabric, sometimes pleated or folded to create a ruffled edge. It was pinned over the shoulder like an ionic sleeve. Hymatian was a much larger rectangle of fabric which wrapped the body in various styles. It was considered a more stately garment worn by both men and women. Greek men rarely wore hats or head coverings with everyday dress. For extended periods of working out in the sun or for travelling, the most common style was the petesos, a broad brimmed hat with a shallow crown and chin straps. Another style was the pilos, a conical hat with a narrow floppy brim. These were made of straw, felt and leather. Women wore a variety of hats and headdresses. A sharply pointed wide brimmed tholia was worn pinned to the hair atop a veil. They also wore a snug version of the patesos. Women arranged elaborate coiffures with many ornaments. They wore tiaras made of carved ivory, bone, wood, bronze or silver at the front of their heads. Over the crown they arranged ringlets with braids with ornate combs and pins. At the back they bound up chignons with ribbons, snoods of linen and fine mesh or attached intricately arranged turbans. Both men and women wore sandals. Many sandal styles with intricate thongs, straps and decorations are found in sculptures. Rustic types of sandals were made with white pieces of leather sewn to the sides of the soles. Horsemen and travellers wore ankle boots. Slaves and lower classes usually went barefoot. The military costume comprises of three components, clothing, armour and weaponry. Clothing was for protection against the elements and against chafing of armour. Body armour consisted of helmet, cuirass and greaves. The helmet was a hemispherical covering contoured to fit close to the skull with cheek guard extensions. It also had horsehair plumes on top to give a more aggressive look to the soldiers. The cuirass was usually constructed with strips of linen glued into layers. These panels were attached to a vest that covered the torso and was tied into place by tapes at the shoulder and one side. A short skirt of overlapping stripes of reinforced linen covered the hips. It was further secured by white leather belts attached around its waist 
and rib cage. Scales of bronze or iron were added on the cuirass by wealthier families. Greaves or shin guards were made of metal, encased the lower legs from the knees to the ankles and were secured by leather straps or colourful ribbons. The more ornate metal cuirass, shown in sculptures depicting heroes and gods in battle, were most likely ceremonial rather than functional. Weaponry included a vast array of specialized devices like swords, daggers, spears, clubs, battle axes, bows, slings and shields, etc. Beneath the armor, the soldiers wore a basic chitin made of soft wool. They also wore the clamis, which had multiple uses as a blanket as well as defensive shield in battle. As the political life in Greece changed over the years and the geographic boundaries shifted, Greek culture developed sophisticated ideas about clothing and appearance. Craftsmen fine-tuned their skills in weaving cloth, tanning leather, making jewellery and decorating garments with paint and embroidery. Alexander became king of Macedonia in 336 BCE. He soon earned the title Alexander the Great and ruled the largest empire in the world, encompassing Greece and vast areas of modern-day Egypt, Spain and India. Upon Alexander's death in 323 BCE, his empire became unstable as various people tried to seize control of different areas. Wars broke out throughout the empire over the next 100 years. The end of Greek dominance in the region occurred in 146 BCE when Romans began ruling the area. This module focuses on the Maurya and Sunga periods, costume and culture. The Mauryan Empire was the largest empire founded in India. The main archaeological sites are Barhut, Sanchi and Pitalkhora. Under the Iranian and Greek influence, the technique for stone carving was restored during this period. Parallel to this, the Roman Empire had been established in the West. China in the East was experiencing its Golden Age, while Europe was totally uncivilized and uninhabited by northern barbarians. Alexander came to India just before this period started with a vision to develop commercial resources. Trade with Babylon was already established by way of the Persian Gulf route and overland with China. Chandragupta Maurya founded the first largest empire in India. Chanakya of Kautilya, minister to Chandragupta, authored Arthashastra, a treatise on government and economics. Megasthenes was the Seleucid ambassador at Maurya court and author of Indica. Chandragupta married a Greek Seleucid princess. Court life had strong Greek and Persian influence. Persian ideology of the seclusion of the king was adopted. The king would receive complaints and visitors in the Hall of Justice. Sacrificial ceremonies were held. Chandragupta kept women bodyguards who served him while elaborate escorts followed the king's procession. The people were fond of amusements and the development of Sanskrit, literature and plays and music was encouraged. Chandragupta lived in splendor and built luxurious palaces with well-maintained lakes, parks and gardens. The land was fertile and so even farmers had plenty. Metals were mined, craftsmen were employed and various specialized vocations were encouraged. The state gave people security, protection, maintained roads and provided reservoirs and wells. Cattle breeding was still an important resource. Gopalaka or cow herd became a part of myth. Trade was carried by land and sea routes. All this ensured that a sense of well-being was generally prevalent. Men and women continued to wear the three unstitched garments of Vedic times, Antarya, Uttarya and Kayabandh. Antarya styles include Kacha style, which was draped around the hips and between the legs, white cotton or linen, flowered muslin, sometimes embroidered in gold with precious stones and gems. Kayaban styles include Vithaka, drum-headed knots at the end, Mujara, elaborate band of embroidery, Patika, 
flat and ribbon shaped, kalabuka, a many stringed one. Uttariya styles, these are usually fine cotton, sometimes silk and used to drape the top half of the body. Uttariya was worn according to the comfort of style of the wearer, elegantly by those at court, draped or one or both shoulders, diagonally across the chest and knotted at the waist or worn loosely across the back at, and supported by elbows or wrist. By the working class, they used it practically to tie it around the head for protection, around the waist to keep the hands free for manual work or as a towel. Women wore transparent antharia. Langoti, a small strip of antharia was attached to the kayaban at the center front and then passed between the legs and tucked in at the back. The longer version was knee length, wrapped and secured around the waist, the longer end pleated and tucked in the front and the shorter end drawn between the legs and tucked at the back waist. Lehenga style was a tubular wrap skirt. Men and women wore similar kayabans. Women additionally wore a patka, a decorative piece of cloth attached to the kayaband. Patka was made from plated wool, cotton, twisted yarn or leather, sometimes also woven. No sculptured evidence is available of footwear during the Maurya and Sunga period. Tattooing was fairly common. Soldiers wore the Persian boot, shepherds, hunters, aborigines and sometimes lower caste people wore simple unbleached coarse varieties of cotton. Primitive tribes wore grass or kusa skins and fur. Women parted their hair centrally and had plates or knots. Uttarya was used to cover the head. Skull caps were used to keep Uttarya in place. Helmets were used by royal women. Turban style was also prevalent. Phrygian women wore long sleeved tunics, tight fitting trousers and Phrygian conical caps with ear flaps. Amazons in India wore crossed at chest belt, vikaksha with metal buckles, shield and sword. Men wore turbans later in the Sunga period. The hair was twisted into a braid along with the turban, twisted and arranged to form a protuberance at the front or side of the head. Jhalar was a jewelled brooch or fringe was used to keep the turban in place. The ends were fan pleated and attached to the turban. In this method, the hair was made into a top knot, two bands of turban crossed exactly at the middle of the forehead to cover the top knot. Brahmins removed their hair except for a ritual coil. In the Maurya period, the jewellery was massive and had coarse workmanship, while in the Sunga period, the jewellery was more refined. Gold and precious stones like corals, rubies, sapphires, agates, crystals, pearl and glass beads were used. Earrings, necklaces, armlets, bracelets and embroidered belts were common to both sexes. The kundal was a simple ring or circle. The dehri was a circular disc earring and the kaan pool was shaped like a flower. There were two main types of necklaces, kantha and lambanam. At the center of the necklaces, an amulet was worn to ward off evil. Kantha was a short, broad, flat, usually of gold, inlaid with precious stones. These were bead or chain necklaces, sometimes three to seven, stringed and named after the number of strings they were composed of. The Mauryas used two types of bracelets. Armlets of gold, known as baju, were worn on the upper arm. Kangan were bracelets made of square or round beads of gold. Meklas were worn by women. These belts of multi-stringed beads were originally made of red kaksha seed but later made of gold and silver beads. Dancing girls added chains of gold and silver to which bells were attached. Kara were anklets worn by all women. Sankla was a thick chain or ornamental circle with small bells called ghungru. Ornaments were worn below the parting of the hair and at the center of the forehead. It consisted of a thin plate of gold or silver stamped in various patterns as well as star-shaped sitara and bina. 
bindi was worn at the center of the forehead. For military costumes, sewn garments from the Persian soldiers were sometimes used. Sleeved tunics, cross straps across the chest to carry quiver and a leather belt with sword. Lower garments were more often the antarya. A mixture of foreign and indigenous garments shows the early phases of the evolution of the Indian costume. For religious costumes, the main ritual for Hindus was sacrifice, led by Brahmin keepers. Later in life, Brahmins became sadhus or sannyasis, seeking detachment. The main garment was a shaped kilt-like garment made of strips sewn together and tied at the waist with a cord. A short rectangular cloak covered the left breast and shoulder. Hair and beard were allowed to grow. Hair was sometimes plaited and spiral knotted at the top of the head. Caps were also worn for protection from the sun. These were often made from leaves, tree bark or ajina, the skin of antelope or goat and then tied with a cord. There is no caste division in Buddhism. It appealed through the lower strata of society. Monks shaved their heads and beards but kept their heads covered with a headdress. If unshaven, it was worn in a knot on top of the head. They wore the common antarya, uttarya and a larger chadar, all dyed saffron. Worn out leather soles strapped to their feet completed the attire. They possessed patra, begging bowl, razor, tweezers for removing hair, nail clippers, ear pick, toothpick, gauze for filtering water, needle, walking stick, umbrella, a fan, and a bag of medicines. Clothes were often rag patched together and dyed red or yellow. Jainism believed in the doctrine of Ahimsa. Jains believed that everything had a soul. This group did not include agriculturists and craftsmen. The Jains did not sacrifice and did not have any caste system. They were mainly moneylenders and traders. Monks and nuns wore a white robe and cloak, covered their mouth and noses with a gauze. They shaved their heads and beards, carried a stick made of three rods bound together, an umbrella, water jug, clay bowl, pot with spout, a broom, a hook, portable stool, a rosary and an arms bowl. Fine and coarse varieties of cloth was woven. Cotton silk, wool, linen and jute fabrics were readily available. The Mauryans used bright red blankets of Gandhara, rain-proof woolen fabrics, resist dyeing and hand-printed fabrics, Indian glazed cotton cloth. The Mauryans also know the felting process. Rajka, Washermen were also dyers and they also perfumed garments. In the Mauryan period, sculptures appear forcefully carved. It gives a feeling of superhuman power. The drapery hangs in heavy folds. The jewelry is massive, coarse and weighty, enclosing strong limbs. In the Sunga period, a greater emphasis is made on details in elaborate jewelry, elegant and fine, with more relaxed postures.